This morning we have a guest speaker. He's the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel, South Los Angeles. Uh, we're glad that we're that he's with us and his family's with us. Uh, years ago I met him at a conference and one of our Calvary Chapel conferences, and uh, uh, it was a blessing to me, a friend. He, you you meet people from all over the world, and uh, when you're in a big conference and all of a sudden you meet someone from your own Los Angeles, you kind of go something like, right? And uh, when they say, orale, you know he's saying, hey, like, what's up, dude, you know? So it, it was a, a neat thing for me. Got to have a, a meal, shared a meal together. We've been friends ever since. Would you welcome Pastor David Trujillo? What's up? All right. You know, I met Ben. You guys don't know this, but men, um, men, Ben, he played a big role in my walk with the Lord uh, in a time in where I was going to give up literally with my marriage. Uh, this brother came, he saw me and just came up to me and just started loving on me, man. And I'm eternally grateful for your friendship, bro. I love you, man. And he, you guys got a good pastor, man. And I'm glad you guys have that. So we're in Daniel chapter 6, and today what I'm going to do, I'm going to read from verses uh, 16 all the way down to 23 in verses 24 and through 28. We'll just kind of read them quickly there, but I'm really going to focus my study today on verse 23. But we're going to go ahead, give you guys, read through it, give you guys a background on what's going on, and then we're going to get into our study. The message, the, the title of the message is, uh, Do You Really Believe in God? We'll see why in a few moments. We read this. Then these men approached the king, oh, I'm sorry, verse 16. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his, signet, with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in, in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him. Because he believed in his God. Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts today, Lord. That if there's anyone that needs to be convicted, that you will convict them. If there's anyone that needs to be strengthened, strengthen them, Lord. Anyone who needs comforting, comfort them. Lord, what we're asking is for you to meet every single one of us exactly where we're at. So that when we leave this place, Lord, we'll be transformed by your word. Comforted by your word and strengthened by it as well. Lord, we're here. Speak to us loud and clear in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. Do you really believe God? You know, when I first got saved, you need to understand that I, I wasn't born again and then immediately I was a pastor. I came to Christianity or to the Lord with a background of, of gangs. I've done a lot of things in my life. I hurt a lot of people in my life. I was a very violent man. And I can be honest with you, if I can be honest with you, um, even when I became a Christian, I still carried a lot of the guilt, the shame, and the pain. In fact, I didn't share this in the first service, but I'll share it with you. I remember one night um, a few years ago, I woke up crying, crying and bawling and t telling my wife, I can't believe I hurt people. And I began to, and, and I told her because in my dream, I can picture all the people that I hurt. They were all kids. And I told her, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this. And my wife hugged me and said, yes, David, I know you were a kid too. But know that God loves you and he forgave you already. 
But I'll be honest with you, all those years I carried that pain, I was never really free from such uh, um, um, thoughts and, and guilt and shame. And the reason why I, I can honestly say is because even though I quoted the Word and even though I taught the Word, the reality is that there were times that I didn't believe the Word. How many of you guys ever been there? Right? You, 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 you know it's so good, but you never take it as, 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 for, like as God is speaking to you directly. We don't believe it. And because we don't believe it, we find ourselves in situations um, longer than we should be. And we're going to see today how not believing the Word of God can inflict pain to your life, but also you can be held captive to such emotions that can dictate what you're going to do or what you're going to say in your life, even making bad decisions. We're going to see that today through our study. But let me give you a backdrop of what's going on right here. Most of you guys know the story of Daniel. And so I'll just kind of briefly go right through it just to, to uh, get you going here in our story. Now, Daniel was cast into the, the lion's dens, as we just read, simply because he made a decision to remain faithful to God, and that's why he was persecuted. Daniel went, if you remember, against the law of man. Uh, when he went, um, when they made a decree that no one can pray to no one but to the king. Well, Daniel said, I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. He remained faithful, and it cost him almost his life, as we're going to see through our scripture. You're going to note that he didn't allow the threats of men to keep him from his relationship with God. He wasn't a coward. He was going to remain faithful, and therefore he did. And, he, and you're going to see at the end of the story how he came out of, the, out of that, that, that den, um, and the Lord did a great work through him. And we'll see all that in a few moments. But I want you to know that King Darius had been tricked. After, being, after realizing that he's been made a fool, he went to Daniel and he calls out for him. And we'll get into that right now. But let me just tell you what happened. Daniel was held captive, um, and he's been held captive for some years now. Actually, I want you to know that he was, he was held captive when Babylon, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, invaded Jerusalem and took all the Israelites captive. Along with those captives was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You guys probably read about that already because I know you're going through the study of Daniel. Along with them was also Daniel. We saw how um, God gave him favor. We saw how he interpreted dreams in chapters 5 and so. And then after that, we do, we do know that after Nebuchadnezzar came Belshazzar. Belshazzar, again, who was filled with pride, he was the one that God wrote on the wall. Remember that he was going to die because he was taking credit for everything that God did for him, right? And he did. Right outside the wall, they did realize that the Persian army was waiting at the, right after the writing of the wall, and the message was given to him. We saw how the Persian army came in, and they pretty much destroyed the Babylonians, killing Belshazzar. Right after that, the one who took rule was Darius. Now, Darius, when he came in, he was a king of Medo-Persia. When he came in, he started liking Daniel. He saw that he was different from all the other guys. He was a man of integrity, a man of a God-fearing man, and he kind of just, he liked them. And he started thinking, planning, you know what, I'm going to make this guy one of the leaders, you know, so he can help me, you know, in, in the affairs here in, in office. So he did. But before he did, I want you to know that there was some haters. We call them player haters. You know what I'm saying? Some haters that saw this foreigner, and they're like, man, what is this guy? Look at this guy, man. We can't allow him to take, you know, right hand, you know, a right hand position there to the king. So what do they do? They try to find some dirt for, uh, on him. So they started looking into the life of Daniel. And I love this about Daniel, that even though they were looking for dirt, they couldn't find none. So what did they do? They had to come up with something. So they started thinking about the life of Daniel. And they said, you know what, Daniel, he prays a lot. He prays to his God. You know what? The only way we can get him is that we make, we make a law that will make him violate it. And we know that if he's praying, if, he, if he's been praying, he's going to continue praying. We can catch him and we can do away with him. So they did. So they went up to, what's his name? Um, there, there he is. And they began to flatter him. You know, oh, Darius, you're so cool, man. You're the greatest ruler of all. You can read it. I'm just paraphrasing and making up my own little words there. But pretty much they're buttering him up. Well, Darius, man, he takes it all in. In fact, he gets drunken by these flattery words. And he does make, and he goes along with this new law that they were going to implement. And the law pretty much said this, listen, no one for 30 days can pray to no one, no other God, just to you, Darius. Darius is like, that sounds good. So he says, all right, let's do it. And immediately when the law was implemented, the, these player haters of Daniel went to Daniel and exactly what they thought he would do, he was doing. You know why? Because he was a man who loved God. Daniel, 
after hearing, you, if you read um, in, in the previous verses, after hearing that decree was implemented, he didn't hesitate. He straight went to, to his, to his um, second-story place. He opened up the window, got on his knees, and just did what he always did. You see, you got to understand that he had a relationship with God. He wasn't playing a role. He was living out his relationship with the Lord. And he wasn't going to let, allow anyone to get into, in, in the way of him and what he had with God. So he's there praying, and just like they planned it, they saw him. Immediately they ran to Darius and said, Darius, what's up, man? You said it. You made a law. You agreed on this law. And you know that once the law is implemented, no one can change it, not even you. That was just part of the Persian law, of this pagan law. So he he didn't know what to do. In fact, in 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 verses 14 and down, you can read for yourselves that Darius begins to try to figure out how he can save Daniel. But he couldn't. Because the law overrode him. So he was under this, he was, he was bound by this, by this law. So King Darius, again, as I noted, was tricked and realizing he had been played a fool. He tried to figure something out, but he couldn't. And I want you to note this, listen, even though he tried to deliver him with all the power, with, all, with everything that he could, he cannot. See, there's certain things that man cannot do that only God can do. You hear me? And here we're going to see how God's going to deliver him. Like, think about it. Can a man actually deliver us from lions? <laughs> no, God can. We'll see right now. But check this out. I want you to note this. God didn't want to save Daniel out of the lion's den. God wanted to deliver him out of it. So, for the main purpose of God doing a work through him, as we'll see at the end of the story. But sometimes we set our hearts to asking God to save us from situations that we really want out, don't we? And, and the reality is we pray and we ask God, Lord, save us out. But I want you to know that God won't save us, doesn't want to save us. He wants to deliver us, but he, wants to allow, he, he allows us to go through it with a purpose, with a purpose. Now, there's some situations that we put ourselves in because of the decisions that we make, right? You know, we make some bad decisions. We go against the word of God. And because we go against the word of God, now we're reaping the consequences of such decisions. And, you know, some of us start blaming God. And God's like, what are you blaming me for? I told you not to date that person. But, Lord, but he's so handsome or she's so pretty. You know, I prayed for him. Yeah, and I answered and said, no, now you're married to him. Now you're married your curse, right? So now we're in a situation and we're like, what am I going to do? Right? And God will help you through it. But that's not the message today. But I will tell you this. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations that we have no control of. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations simply because we're doing the will of God. And sometimes we will say, Lord, get us out of here. This hurts. This is painful. I don't want to go through this. And God says, no, you wait, because I'm going to do something through that. He matures you. He increases your faith. He gives you a better underst- a deeper understanding of his heart. So that's why we need to learn to just wait on God and see these situations as opportunities for God to grow our faith, to mature us. Are you hearing me? Look, I remember my son, man. Everything was good. Uh, my wife's, my relationship with my wife got way better, man. Everything was amazing. And then the enemy realized he couldn't get to me and my wife. You guys know this. He goes after your kids, right? So he went after my, one of my, middle, my middle child. Isaac was dear. He's still dear to me, don't get me wrong. But Isaac was the sporty one. He's the one that always likes hanging out with Papa, Right? And, you know, he, we, we, I coached him throughout his life, and, and he got to the age where he wanted to do his own thing. And he ended up getting high, started drinking and stuff like that. And I'll be honest, to make a long story short, it started, I was like, Lord, really, Lord? This is hard. God, why are you putting me through this? Lord, please take my kid out of that lifestyle. Bring him back. And it took a while for finally God to get me to a place where I say, Lord, do whatever you can, but please don't kill my son and send him to hell. God said, don't worry, David, I got under control. So what happened for three and a half months, I had to, you know, see all the, the charges that he would do on, on my card. I realized that he was going to some, some um, wheat shops and buying weed and getting high, drinking. I find stuff in the house. And I was like, Lord, when, God, when? And then finally, you know, I, it got to a point where I, he did something. I just said, okay, enough's enough. And I confronted him, and I had to kick him out. And I'll be honest with you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life to see my boy leave the house after he's been with me all those years. 
And I gave him a, a, a choice. Daddy, you can stay here if you repented, right? If not, you got to go. He left. Three and a half months, I told God, Lord, please. I began to pray. God said, David, I want you to date him. I said, okay, I'll date my son. I will hang out with them. Everything was cool and dandy until one day. And I'm, and I'm trying to squeeze this story as much as I can, okay? But I'll tell you this. I remember that one day my son came home and said, Dad, can I come home? And I said, yeah, you can come home, Dad, if you repented. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm repented. So he came home, right? And he says, Dad, can I have a word with you, Mom? I said, yeah, sure. And he said, Dad, you know why I came home? I said, why, Daddy? He said, Dad, it was easy for you guys to love me when I was doing good. It's easy when I'm doing great. He says, but you love me at my worst. At my worst. And he said, and only a fool can turn away that type of love. And that day I grabbed my son and I hugged him and I told him, you don't even understand what just happened here. I said, all these years I've been struggling with hate and anger. All these years I thought God would never use me again. And I battled with that. Today, and I told him, you got your story, Dad, and God's going to use it in a mighty way. I said, but I want you to know right now that today God used you to deliver me. And I said, because that moment when my son told me that, God said, David, if you can love your son at his worst, how much more do you think I love you? And you know something? Even though I didn't want to go through that situation, even though I, want, I was asking God, please turn my, my son around, you know, please, God, God wanted to show me, David, I'm trying to get you to understand that you are dear to me. So you need to understand, listen, church, that there are times that you're going to find yourself in a situation that you're not going to like. You're going to want to pray, God, get me on. And God said, no, no, no. You need to be in that den. Because in that den, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to mature you. I'm going to increase your faith. Just like he did to Daniel, as we just read. In fact, notice, he's in the den of lions. You hear me? He's in a den of, of lions. He's surrounded by lions. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. Because sometimes we read these stories, and we just kind of read them quickly. And because we know them... We really don't stop and kind of try to picture it, right? Me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a guy that has a very live imagination, right? So, so I started thinking, can you imagine how Daniel felt, what he was thinking when he was being lured down to the den? And, and as soon as his feet, you know, the sole of his feet touched the ground, he knew there were lines around him, right? And immediately, I mean, just think about it. You hear And then you're like, oh, God, I can picture that and saying, oh, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I know you're there with me, God. Help me, Lord. And then he can feel the fur of the lines rubbing against his feet. Oy. Right? You'll be like, oh, he's senorito. Right? I mean, think about it. This was happening. These were li adult lions. So don't tell me that you've been in a worse situation than him. But the way he dealt with it allowed him to come out victorious. And think about it. I am sure that when he came out of that lion's den, and as we're going to see the reaction of Darius, oh, he's all excited. But what about Daniel? I bet, I don't know about you, but if I was Daniel, I'd be like, wow. Awesome. I bet you his faith was at a high level. Listen, like Daniel, we can find ourselves like that, but we can also find God. But Daniel, at that moment, he's surrounded by these lions, as we noted in verse 16. I want you to know that these lions were breed to be furious, and also they were kept in a state of near starvation. These lions were breed so they can be a means of judgment for the Medo-Persian Empire. Like, I don't know about you, man. I had a little dog, a wannabe chihuahua with hair. I love this little dog. dog. But there was this cat that decided to make her, her home underneath my house. Little black cat. I tell you, black cats are from the devil. But this little black cat, not little, she was about this big. Well, she's bigger than my chihuahua wannabe. But 
when my, she, my little dog was old, so she would go out and use the restroom. And one day, the cat jumped on my dog because she had little kittens, jumped on my dog and just sliced her up. I remember, I remember she walked in all bleeding. I was like, oh, Belita, Belita, right? And I can't believe that dog and that cat. I'm looking for it, right? So I said, whatever. I, it got away. And then again, the next time she went out, sliced her up, and he killed my little dog. Oh, I got angry. I was so angry. I got a broom, right? I got a broom, and I went out there to try to pray for her. No, I didn't. I wanted to <laughs> beat the living lights out of this cat. And I finally cornered the cat. It was like in a corner, and I'm there like, what's up now? What's up now, fool? Like, I went back to my own ways, right? And the cat was like, eeeh, eeeh. And I'm like, what? And then when she started going, like that, I started going, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then I said to myself, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm scared of this little cat. And I'm thinking, could you imagine Daniel? Not hearing, but think about it. So I try to get myself into the story because this actually happened. Lions were surrounding Daniel. Verses 18 through 20, we read, and the king, so he's there by night. Again, we saw in verse 17 how he, you know, he pretty much put his mark saying, I got to keep the law. Nobody can open it. He, whatever's going to happen to Daniel, it can't change. The law is the law. But the king didn't want to do it. But he had to do it. Verse 18 says, now the king went to this, his palace, and he spent the night, notice, fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. So this guy, this king, after such foolish degree, he had it enforced. Seeing that he couldn't change it, he went to his palace, and he spent the whole night sleepless, miserable, contemplating, no doubt, Daniel's fate. I wonder if he's thinking, oh, my goodness, I, he was such a good, I, mean, I was going to make him my right-hand man. Why did I, do, I, I wonder, he's beating himself. I mean, we always, in the, in the previous ver verses I mentioned, he tried his best to get him out of the situation, but he couldn't. So now he's at a place where, like, I can't believe how stupid could I have been. Only if I would, I mean, he was in total regret. He can't sleep. Listen, he was genuinely concerned over Daniel, and no doubt that his heart was not in agreement with the treatment Daniel was getting. Darius, whose heart was condemning him for sure, was part of this conspiracy against God's servant. But what he did, he did it without knowing. He got tricked into it. And that to tell you this, listen, sometimes we sin willfully. Sometimes we sin because it's our nature. or Sometimes we do something because we be deceived into doing it. Regardless of the situation, people always get hurt. But I know in my, in my life, I've, 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 I've joined in conversations when I'm talking about someone, not about someone, but I'm talking to someone, and then they start gossiping. And, and that, you know, because I'm not a, like Jesus, you know, I'm just, instead of saying, stop the gossip, man, come on. I just like, yeah, yeah, I hear you, yeah. And then you throw your own little two cents, right? Yeah, I remember that too, you know, whatever. But somehow, this other person gets word, and they call you up, and they're like, hey, how can you do that? That was messed up. How can you talk about me? I thought we were friends, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. And now you're like, wait, wait, but they hang up on you, you know what I'm saying? So now you're at home like this guy without sleep, and you're like, oh, Lord, why? Why did I do that? I should have just rebuked him. I should have corrected him, but no, I had to go along with it, right? And now I hurt this guy. Oh, Lord, what do I do? Well, let me ask you, let me tell you this. If you're a believer... Let me give you uh, something to do, all right, to make things right. Know that, know that these situations, listen co closely, are perfect opportunities. This is important for the enemy to attack you. Are you hearing me? Because the devil never rests. He is in constant attack mode, okay? So even if you're walking with the Lord and everything is all fine and dandy and you make a little mistake like I just mentioned, the devil will jump on it and he will try to discourage you. He will try to get you to question your walk with God, try to get you to question God's love. I mean, he just got to, is going to tell you, oh, man, you call yourself a Christian. You were just gossiping. Oh, my goodness. God doesn't want you. God doesn't love you, man. What? You're no good. You, you know what I'm talking about? You need to understand that he's trying to disqualify you and take you out of business. 
That's why it's important that you believe the word of God and that you submit to the word of God and you do what God tells you to do. So what, would, what should you do? Well, very simple. Here's the thing. What do you do to stop the enemy? Well, pray and seek the Lord. Ask for forgiveness from God. And here's the thing. Seek him and then ask him what you need to do to make things right. Then you go to the person, right? And you confess to the person. Be honest with them. And then apologize. Trust me, the word sorry can get you <laughs> far. And I know it's hard sometimes because you know why? Pride wants to keep you from saying sorry. You know, something be like, I'm sorry. what? I'm sorry. Just say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it, man. My bad, right? But sometimes people accept your apologies. Sometimes they don't. So what do you do if they don't? Well, you entrust it back to the Lord and you keep going forward. Never stopping trying to men- make things right. Here's the thing that is important. Once you do that, don't let the devil have no more room in your mind. Just let it go and let God. I said earlier, like Elsa from Frozen said, let it go. For an unbeliever, what do you do? If you're battling with shame and guilt because you did something accidentally to hurt someone you care and love. And you're being drained because of guilt and shame. Well, here's the thing. Turn to the Lord. God will work it out in your life, but know that this is an opportunity for God to take a hold of your, hand, of your heart and save you. Because sometimes we make decisions prior to our conversion, and God, the consequences or the end results, God uses to speak to us. You see what I'm saying? So, this is what God is inviting you to do. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. That's an invitation for you, man. You know, when I came to the Lord 27 years ago, I went to Calvary Chapel Chino Valley with David Rosales. And I remember it was a crowd about this, this, about this, this size. And I remember I was sitting way in the back with my size 50 pants and a white t-shirt and convert and bald head. And I remember sitting right there, mad dog, and saying, that guy looks like Flanders from The Simpsons. That's what I was thinking in my mind. And then after that, I, he made an altar call. The guy who took me said, you want to go? I'll go with you. I said, let's homie, I'll go on my own. And I walked up on my own. I was bad in my mind. And I stood right in front there. And he said the sinner's prayer. And when he said the sinner's prayer, I opened my eyes, and Rosales looked at me, and he said, welcome to the family of God. That day, a burden was lifted. Been walking with the Lord for 27 years now, 28 years now. And I can tell you this, I didn't, never regret that decision. God was true to his word. He will be true to you, I guarantee you. Amen? So, here's Darius. Sleepless night, restless, no doubt, but Daniel is resting. Why? Because the Lord is with him. Think about it. With lions at his disposal, he probably had lion pillows or like linen pillows, lion pillows, you know what I'm saying? He had a fur, a, a nice little fur uh, coat to keep him warm. I mean, this guy was, was, was chillaxing is what we say. He had peace, perfect peace, because the Lord was with them. And also the lions. Even with hungry lions around Daniel, Daniel was surrounded by the Lord. That is why he was in a place of safety and peace. And you see, guys, listen closely. That's what God does to those that take him on his offer. Seems like Darius was the one suffering like a slave while Daniel was reigning like a king. But going back to the story, notice, as he's there, he's waiting, he can't sleep. He wakes up in the morning, and what does he do? He rose early in the morning, and he went in haste to the den of lions because he really didn't want Daniel to die. He was really hoping that Daniel's God would deliver him. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God. And he's yelling because he's yelling down at the den, right? He says, servant of the living God, notice, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Now, I want you to know something here. This pagan God acknowledges that Daniel was a faithful servant. He said, whom you serve, what? Continuously. It is awesome when the world can see your faithfulness to God 
and give you respect because you're a faithful servant of the Lord. You have the opportunity and the privilege to represent God at work, at church, at home. And the only way praises can come from people that are not true believers of God, you know how? When you are living a righteous life before God. I said earlier in the first service that there's a man that was well respected by atheists. His name was Billy Graham. And this is what they said about Billy Graham. They said, listen, we don't believe what he believes. But we can tell you he believes. He, know, he believes what he believes. Because he was a man of integrity. A, a God-fearing man. And a man who loved the Lord. Can that be said of you? Are we representing God in such a way that God is honored? Or are we representing God as Paul wrote to the Romans? Blaspheming the Lord by the way they conduct themselves. We have the opportunity to bless God through the way we live or blaspheme God by the way we live. And my encouragement to you, man, is get sold out for Jesus Christ and be his ambassador. Represent him at a high. In fact, we're in a perfect opportunity today. America's, uh, uh, we're in a perfect opportunity to be a light because this world is dark, isn't it? What's right is wrong, what's right is wrong, what's wrong is right. Everyone living according to what's right in their own eyes. The Bible says this is going to happen in the last days. And you and I have been given the privilege and the honor to make our lives shine. So shine. Shine brightly for the Lord. You hear me? But here's Daniel. And notice the, the, this pagan God, this pagan king recognizes his faithfulness. How about you guys? Do your friends realize that you're a Christian? Or are you those Christians that live a compromised life? And then when you say, I'm a Christian, they'll be like, huh? You're a Christian? How long? Well, uh, like five years. Really? Oh, wow. My, I didn't. Me too. Oh, you're a Christian. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, because y'all were partying together. But if y'all would be worshiping together, y'all would have known what I'm talking about, right? Let the world know and let them sing praises without them knowing that you're a true servant of the Most High. Well, that's what happened here with Daniel. So again, he responds. Notice his response. Daniel says, to the, to the ones he was asked if God delivered him. He said, king, he says, oh, king, live forever. He says, out of respect, my God sent his angel, and he shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, oh, king, I have done no wrong before you, he tells them. He tells them. So the answer to his question is, of course, God is able. In fact, God did. God did. But can I tell you something I didn't mention earlier that I think is important? When Daniel was in that lion's den, his faith was increasing. I guarantee you that he was banking on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's testimony of God's faithfulness. Because he was around there. We don't know if he was there at that place or maybe he was in another city taking care of business when he was under the rule of, of Nebuchadnezzar. But I'm sure he heard about it. So when he was in that den, the man that he is, no doubt was probably reflecting on the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and was using that to help himself in the situation. How important it is for us to be in the Word of God so that when we find ourselves in situations like that and God is increasing our faith, we can go back to the stories of the Bible and find strength and encouragement. That's why it's important that you read your Word. That's why it's important that you're in it day and night so that you can use the Word of God to help you through your trials and tribulations in life. Amen? So here it is. He says, listen, God is able. So again, no one has a right to question God's ability, for he is omnipotent or all-powerful. He's also both creator and sustainer of the universe. God was able to deliver him just like he was able to deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, you need to understand that God delivered Daniel from the king of the beast. Because Daniel was with the king of kings and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Can I tell you this? You are untouchable. You're the original untouchables. Have you ever seen the movie Untouchables? I, when I, I, I was in love with mafia movies. I realized that when I became a Christian, I'm untouchable. Until God calls me home. And let me share this story with you, man. I, I remember once I got asked to go speak. There was this one guy. His name was Boxer. He was a, a co-founder of the Mexican Mafia. He, he had diabetes, and he was going to die soon. So he asked me by another, through another brother, hey, bro, can you come and share uh, something with, with, with some of my friends? I said, sure. So I got to the place, right, and you can see all the lowriders, all these old veteranos, 
OG, original gangsters. And they're off, you know, a lot of these nice cars. I mean, it was just packed. It was at least 300 or 400 people. So I got up and I started preaching, right? People, a few people raised their hands. They got right with God. And then afterwards, you know, I finished. I came down and they came up to me like, hey, homie, want to tell you that was firme. I said, hey, bro, it's not about firme, homie. God loves you. And I would share the gospel with them. One guy said, came up to me and says, hey, homie, out of respect, man, I'll tell you this. I respect you, homie, because you, you've you been through it. You know, because I share some deep stuff. And then after I told him, you don't have to respect me, bro. I said, but all I encourage you is to bow your knee to the king. Because if you die without Christ, you will end up in hell. And when I said that, the guy next to me was like this. And I'm like, what's wrong with you, bro? He goes, do you know who you're talking to? I go, no, why? Do you know where you're at? And I go, no, Why? He goes, bro, look around you. And I go, I'm looking, I'm looking. He says, all these dudes are active Mexican mafia members. And the guy that you just talked to, he's the hitman of the Mexican mafia. And I'm like, what? Why did you tell me that before, bro? I wouldn't have come. No, I didn't say that. I I just said, really, bro? Are you serious? He goes, yeah, bro. He goes, what happened was they know he's going to die. But because he did so much work for the Mexican mafia, they wanted to go go and hear him speak for for, for their last time out of respect. So you're addressing active Mexican mafia members. And I remember driving home thinking, I'm the original untouchables. I was able to look at the hitman and say, if you die without Christ, you end up in hell. You know why? Because God was protecting me. When you're in the will of God, God will protect you. Listen to me. And you you might say, but what about those Christians that die? What about those Christians that do get, you know, eaten by lions like as recorded in the early church. What about those Christians that get their heads cut off or those Christians that get shot? What about them, David? To you, I will say, they went to heaven. They graduated. They went to the place that we're waiting to go to. So why are we worrying about These people got the honor to die for their Lord. They're in glory. Can you imagine when they stand before God, that's the greatest thing you can do for God is to die for him? They're going to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Dude, don't worry about them. They're rejoicing in glory. They're alive right now because they offered their, their bodies. Listen to me. We can do the same. How? Well, I'm not asking you to go and cut, have your head cut off. What I am asking you is die to yourself. Die to your start there and then see what God would do through you. But here's the thing. God will protect you. You're divinely protected until God calls you home, until he's done with you. So you know what? After service, go out here, go find the gangman. I'm just joking. Don't do that. Just pray and let the Lord direct you and guide your feet. And don't be afraid. Why? Because the enemy will use fear to cripple you and keep you from the blessings that God has when you do God's will in your life. You know what's the greatest blessing, guys? To see someone get right with God. Think about it. Why do you think the devil, as soon as God tells you, tell him that I love him, you're like, Lord, really? All these excuses comes out, right? You start saying, no, what if he rejects me? Or what if this? Or what if that? Or what if my friends don't want to hang out with me no more? You start thinking that, right? Why do you think? Because you're, you're messing with, with the enemy. See, his plan is to kill, steal, and destroy. Our purpose is to spread the gospel so that through the gospel they might find life, eternal life in Christ. So why do you think he's going to try to inflict all that, all that in your mind? Why do you think he's going to try to get you to freak out or be or crippled by fear? To keep you from doing what God knows will bless you. Because what greater joy is to see someone being snatched out of Satan's grip and then placed in the arms of a loving God because they responded to the gospel. You hear me? So here it is, back to the story. <laughs> so, so, so here's uh, uh, Darius. And he's freaking out. Not freaking out. He's, he's excited, man. He's, he's just overwhelmed with joy. But notice what he says. He says, the Lord was able to do it. Notice, Daniel, the servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually has been able to deliver you. Then Daniel said, oh, my, in verse 22, my God sent his angel, and he shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. Because why? He says, because I was found innocent before him, and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. So he was protected, divinely protected. And God was not done with Daniel. He still had a work, a, a job for him to do. And like I said, God would do the same for you. You are protected. But notice he used an angel. He used an angel to keep the lion's mouth shut. 
we note there. If Darius didn't know about angels, well, guess what? Daniel just informed him about angels. And we know that angels are God's ministering spirits, aren't they? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, uh, the author of Hebrews writes that. Psalms 37, verse 7, talks about the, the ministry of angels. Psalms 91, verse 11, as well as Psalms 103, verse 20. Just like God will send angels, I'm sure the same God today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow will do the same to keep watch over us. But Daniel also knows why God shut the lion's mouth. Notice, not only to protect him, but he said, because I was found innocent before him, O king, I have done no wrong. He's saying, listen, I want you to understand that I never did nothing wrong. I'm innocent. So God delivering Daniel demonstrates that God vindic vindicated Daniel. Daniel was praying after the degree was implemented, <laughs> right? Um, um, seems like an act of disobedience on Daniel's part. It was a law, right? But you need to understand that he wasn't in the wrong. He was in the right. Why? Because he would not bow a knee to a law that went against his relationship with God. And, you know, especially the last couple of years, you know, with all everything that was going on in America, right? We had to rise up, didn't we? And you heard those scriptures that says it's better to obey God over man, right? And, and there was Christians. That would trip me out. There was Christians that were saying, you know, you're going to obey the laws of the land. And say, yes, we obey the laws of the land to the T. But once those laws go against the laws of God, our allegiance is to the Lord. And that's where we need to make sure that we are obeying this word, not the world's word. You hear me? Man, I got a lot to say, but I won't go that far. I'll just stay there. But I want you to know he will not bow on me. He will not. And listen, right now, there's laws that are being made in America. And they're using the word love for us to be acceptance, be accepted of all this, life, this lifestyle that is sinful, harming. Listen to me closely. And heartbreaking. And they're telling you, no, no, you got to accept this. And, you, and we say, no, we don't. We accept the person but not the lifestyle. We speak up against the lifestyle. Oh, that's hate speech. And you say, no, that's not hate speech. You mean that my child is playing with a live socket there? If he's playing around it, and I tell him, don't play because you're going to get shocked. Is that hate speech or is that love? It's love. But we don't accept those. We go against it. We go against those laws. The murdering of babies, abortion, that's murder. The Bible says that God hates the shedding of innocent blood. And what's more innocent than a baby has never even given the opportunity to step into this world? We rise up. Our allegiance is to the Lord, amen, to the word of God, not to this world. And that's what Daniel did. He said, listen, I didn't do no wrong. They try to make it look like that. I'm cool, man. So by God delivering him, he was vindicating him. Now, verse 23, notice what happens. Now, the king was exceedingly glad. Well, think about it, man. That was his buddy. That was his friend. You know, he was going to make a, you know, ruler over other governor rulers there. And, and he, so when he sees that he's out, you know, he hears that he's alive, he's glad. He's rejoicing. Notice. And then he gives a command that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury. And this is key. Whatsoever was found in him because what? He believed in his God. That's key right there. What if Daniel wouldn't believed in God? What would have happened then? What would you do? What, what would you do in that situation? I've been in situations where my faith was tested. And I can honestly say I felt miserably. And because of it, I inflicted upon my life unnecessary pain. Are you hearing me? Regret. Sorrow. Right? Some women have done it and they end up with pregnancies, you know, out of wedlock. You know, some have ended up with transsexual diseases, right? Uh, some people have bad livers, you know. I mean, all kinds of stuff has happened all because we didn't believe God. And I'm speaking to believers now. That's why I ask the question, do you believe God's word? Do you really believe the word of God? Notice again, it says that Daniel had no injury. Daniel was preserved to the max. Let me simply state that when God's hand is around us, you can be assured that not a scratch will behold our body. But note this, Daniel didn't sustain any injury because he believed in the Lord. He believed in the Lord. Through his faith, Daniel was able to stand in the midst of those lions. 
Hebrews 11, 33, we read, who through faith seduced kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. In fact, when you read the entire chapter of Hebrews, you'll be blessed and also impressed that the saints of God overcame because of their faith. In fact, faith was, quote, the greatest essential in the lives of the saints, unquote. Such heroes of our faith knew what trusting in God meant. They truly believed that God could and would if it was his will to do so. It was through Daniel's faith that the lion's mouth was shut. It was through Daniel's faith that allowed him to overcome, that preserved him from pain or for anything else that would happen because we don't believe. You know, God tells us not to worry, right? We lose our job, we freak out, <laughs> right? Oh, God, what happened? You know, and God says, don't worry about it. And then he reminds you, hey, do you remember the little birdies? Remember that story Jesus talked about? Notice how those little birds, they don't suffer. I provide for them. I remember Sonia once telling me, oh, my goodness, the other day, man, I was eating something, and I saw little birdies falling, coming, not falling, coming, right? And she got a little hamburger, took the bread, and started throwing the bread and the french fries. And while she was doing that, she said, and the Lord spoke to me that verse, that God was using me as a means to provide for them. And, and, and I remember saying, oh, yeah, that's right, that God does provide for us like that. In fact, listen to me. God tells you don't worry because he knows the damage that worry does to your body. It does a lot of, in fact, I, I told earlier, so I'm going to read it to you guys. I Googled it, okay? But check it out. It says this. You ready? It says, if it sticks around long enough, talking about worrying, sometimes as small as a nagging concern in the back of your mind can affect your heart. It can make you more likely to have, a high, to have high blood pressure, a heart attack, or a stroke. Higher levels of anxiety can trigger those stress hormones that, that make your heart beat faster and harder. Worry. Here's another thing. You get anxiety, right? Depression. That's all part of worrying. But here's the, the symptoms of someone dealing with anxiety. Stomach pain, nausea, digestive trouble, uh, trouble headaches, insomnia, or other sleep issues, right? Uh, weakness or fatigue, rapid breathing or shortness of breath, pounding of heart or increased heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, muscle tensions and pain, asthma, heart problems, migraines, visual problems, back problems, and the list goes on. Because we don't believe God when he says, hey, I'm going to provide don't worry about it. Look at, the, look, at the, look at those flowers. They're better dressed than Solomon in all his glory and all those glorious garments he has. How much more you were made in my image? Look, check this out. So I remember one day when God finally sealed the deal for me to become a pastor. You know, I, I, we were, we were, I was going from job to job, and they were letting me go. And, 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 and I'll tell you this, and I was getting frustrated, man, because I saw that we were really struggling, you know. Uh, but God was teaching me something looking back now. But I remember I started complaining, and I turned to Sonia, and I told Sonia, you know what, I'm tired of this. Where is God? You know, he said that he was going to provide for me. I've been out in the street, man, looking for a job. I get hired for a few minutes, not minutes, hours or maybe days, and then they let me go. Where is God? Man, I'm tired of eating Capitan Cereal or whatever name brand. You know, I want Captain Crunch, right? What happened? I don't even got $20 for gas no more. I'm complaining, and while that happens... And I went immediately into pastor mode. Yes. <laughs> and I opened the door, and these two couple walk up and says, Pastor, we were praying, and the Lord put it in our hearts to do this for you. What is it? Hold on. And they walk in with like 20 bags of food. And they put it on the ground. And the first thing my eye caught was Captain Crunch. And I remember think, looking at Sonia, Sonia's like, and I'm like, and I'm like, thank you very much. Lord bless you. They walk out, and I'm, me and her, we're just looking at each other like, whoa, that was crazy. And then you hear another knock. It's them again. Hey, what's up? Hey, man, we really appreciate the food. I know. Thank you, Pastor. You're so good. Um, as I was walking out, the Lord told me to give you this, 20 bucks. Sorry, guys. But I remember I grabbed my wife. I ran to the bathroom and I said, I know I'll be behind a pulpit for the rest of my life. God will take care of us. And he did. 
and still does. Listen, don't worry about it. Trust the Lord. You're made in his image. He will take care of you. Are you hearing me? Because when you start worrying, you start making decisions that can lead to consequences. Are you hearing me? Believe God. Trust his word. And watch him work it out in your life. Now, moving quickly, Daniel's faith delivered him from the mouth of the lions as he trusted in the Lord in this harsh situation. It was his faith that pleased the Lord, allowing God to do what he desired to do in Daniel's life. And in doing so, God was pleased. You guys know the scripture. It's impossible to please him without faith. In Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Don't miss that out. Those who diligently seek him will get rewarded. You know what those rewards are? Blessings. Not only here on earth, but in heaven. Are you hearing me, man? Man, find strength in that, man. Find strength in that. So my question to you is, do you believe in God? Do you believe in the God you say you trust and sing about his faithfulness? If not, then how can you be delivered from the situations you find yourselves in? That's why you're miserable. That's why you're struggling. Because you lack faith. You should pray, God, increase my faith. And God will say, no problem, I'll do that. Someone said a living faith in the living God will give courage and strength for every emergency in life. Unquote. Did you hear that? A living faith in the living God will give courage and strength for every emergency of life. Daniel believed, and he was injured free. Verse 24, and the king gave the command. So this is happening. There's excitement. Daniel, you're alive. Awesome. And then he goes, hey, hey, guys, let's make another degree. Get Daniel out of there right now. He gave the command notice that, to get him out. And it says, he, and, uh, he brought those, and then he brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions, then, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Could you imagine that? Daniel gets out of the den, and then the wicked are thrown in there and their families. Now, let me make things really clear here. Okay, very important. Their deaths, we know they were painful, no doubt, and immediate. But I want you to know that this tragic wasn't Daniel's plan or an idea. You see, under the Mosaic law, the family, wives, and children wouldn't have been subjected to the punishment of death with those found guilty of attempted murder. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, it says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. So this wasn't God. You hear me? I want you to know that the penalty here was in keeping with pagan laws. You hear me? So this tragic act wasn't God's demand, but it was according to the custom of the Medes and the Persians. But it's very important to know regarding sin. And listen closely. Sin affects everyone. If you're committing sin right now in secret, it affects everyone. You hear me? Eventually it's going to come out. You know why, Christian? Because God loves you too much to let you get away with it. And he want, he's going to bring it out. If you're watching porn sites, oh, it'll come out. If you're over there stealing, oh, it'll come out. If you're lying, guess what? The truth will prevail. It will come out. Why? Because God loves you too much to leave you in that sin. And it's important that you understand that because if you don't, and if you keep rejecting the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon your life, eventually it's going to catch up. It's gonna, you're going to get exposed. And not only are you going to hurt yourself, but you're going to hurt the people that are around you, people that you love. These divorces, they didn't, they didn't just wake up and say, huh, I don't love my wife or I don't love my husband, I'm gone. No, they were, doing, they were making decisions that led to them liking other people, watching things. You know, pornography is pretty bad, man. <laughs> and it makes it, you, you're never satisfied. You want more, you want more, and you start making decisions that now you're not satisfied. You want more, and then you're making decisions where you, you eventually abandon your spouse. And you might think, well, I can survive, you know what? But what about the kids? What about the kids? 
Maybe you're drinking alcohol, right? And you're thinking, well, I can handle it. I'm a sipping saint. I'm okay. God's forgiven me. I'm not getting drunk. Well, you drink coffee. I can drink a beer. Nothing wrong with that. But let me ask you a question. Can your kids handle that? Can your kids handle that? I'm, I'm a father, and as a father, I want to influence my children to love the Lord, not the world. I am not going to put something. You know what? I might as well just give them a loaded gun and say, here, play Russian roulette. But how can I do that to my babies? And you know something? I prefer to get rid of that drink and buy me a Gatorade than to drink something, and then they take it, and they end up killing themselves. I heard a story by Adrian Rogers. I'm going to sum it up quickly. He said a story. Now, one day he got a call from the sheriff department. And in this call, he tells them, we need you to come to the moral, to, uh, to the hospital, I would say. There's been an accident. And, kid, and there were some kids that were killed. We need you to come so you can identify the body to see if it's your daughter. He immediately grabbed his keys and, and he flew off the, the door and he went to, to this place. He ran in there and he said, please, officer, let me, let me see so the officer walks the man, and there's the body covered in a blanket. He picks up the sheet, and he says, is this your daughter? He looks at her eyes, and he realizes, that's my baby. Her body was torn in pieces from the accident. No one survived. He tells the sheriff, how did this happen? How did this happen? Well, they were all drinking and driving. They lost control. They hit. The car tumbled, and she died. What do you mean? She's only 18 years old. She can't buy alcohol. Who, who, who bought her the alcohol? Oh, I can't wait till I find that. Put my, get my hands on that fool. You kill my daughter. After they calmed him down, he went home, and he's sitting there crying and missing his baby. So he decided to take a drink. So he goes to his cabinet and he opens his, 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 the, the doors of the dresser there or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. And he realizes that his bottle's missing. And there was a note there that said something like this. Daddy, I hope you don't get mad, but I'm going to borrow one of your bottles just to celebrate my 18th birthday. I promise to give it back. You have no control of what your children or your wife or your spouse will do. But you do have control how you can influence. Why would you do that? Sin hurts everyone around you, not just you. Sin will bite you and hurt you. Just what we see here. You think these individuals, you know, they got thrown into a lion's den. They all died because these guys made an attempt to murder one of the governors who was going to be assistant. The pleasures of sin last but for a moment. The consequences of sin can last a long time. Well, in Proverbs 11, 8, the word of God says the righteous is delivered from trouble, like Daniel was, and it comes to the wicked instead. 25 and 26, and I'm coming to an end. After all this was happening, they were all excited, you know, in the fact that Daniel didn't die. The King Darius wrote, he wrote a letter to all the people, nations, languages that dwelt in the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree. Notice that, that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before, notice this, the God of who? Daniel. For he is the living God. Notice that. He is, a, he is and steadfast forever. And his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. And he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who delivers Daniel from the power of life. I mean, you read that. You can say, wow, man, this guy was a believer. But we just read that he wasn't a follower. He was a fan. He was a fan of the God of Daniel, not a follower of the God of Daniel. And listen closely. There's people that can speak like Christians. You know, what's up, brother? Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. I mean, we got it all packed down. There's people here that have their Bibles marked up, but their lives are not marked up by the Bible. 
There's people here who think they are believers, but they're not. And God brought you here to tell you, listen, you're not a follower. You're just a fan. You like. You know, when you, go, when you watch a baseball game, like right now, the Dodgers being the uh, Colorado Rockets, yay. Anyways, my, my bad. Don't get mad at me. But the fans sit and they cheer when their team hits a, a hit or a home run. The players are playing, though. So you're either a player or you're a fan. So, so here's the thing. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. I'm not going to have you turn there. But I want to paraphrase, and I encourage you guys to read it, because this is important and scary at the same time. Jesus said that in the last days, many will come to me, speaking about the great white throne judgment. And they're going to say to him, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy? Did not we make wonders in your name? I mean, these people were active. These people had it all packed down. Not everyone of them says to me, Lord, Lord, we'll enter the kingdom of God. They knew the language. They even knew who Jesus was. They were active in the church, whether it be youth, youth uh, camps or whether it be uh, ushers or worship team or, or even Bible teachers. And Jesus says, but I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Can you imagine you standing before God like this and you say, Lord, I went to Calvary Chapel. You know, Ben, I, I literally wrote all his studies down in my notes. Lord, you don't understand. I was there at the orphanages. Lord, I was there. I was there. I gave Bible studies. And God looks at you and tells you, I don't know you. Those would be the saddest words you will ever hear because right after you hear those words, you will enter into eternity never again to be held by the love, the arms of God. You will never hear his voice. You will be separated from God in hell for all eternity, all because you thought you can pull one on God, but you've only pulled it on yourself because do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. Maybe the Lord brought you here for that morning, for that reason today. And God is saying, you're not a follower, you're just a fan. You need to be a follower. Doesn't matter how you speak, how you worship. Do you really know me is the question. Because when you're in hell, and I'm praying you don't go to hell. One thing you will, what's going to make hell, hell, you know what it is? Apart from Jesus, you, you'll never see Jesus. You'll have your mind, and you'll remember this sermon. See, if you end up in hell, you have no one to blame but yourselves. Because in order for you to get, go to hell, you have to jump over every roadblock that God threw in your way. All those prayers that people prayed for you, you have to go over them. All those uh, tracts that were handed to you, you have to go over them. All those invitations that were given in youth camp or even in church, you have to go over them. All those sermons that you heard from this pulpit or from the radio when you're driving to work, you have to go over them. In fact, you have to go over the dead body of Christ to go to hell. You have no one to blame but yourselves. This man, I don't know whether he got, became a believer or not, but he sure wasn't his God. It was the God of Daniel. My God loves you, and he wants a relationship with you, and he wants to bless you. Because notice verse 28. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So what happens? God's children will always be blessed because all the blessings and the promises recorded in this marvelous book is for only his people. And if you're not his people, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 12, and to many who have received them, to them he gives them the what? The power to become children of God. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe God? Do you know God? Because you can't start believing in him until you first get to know him. Believe in his word. Hear me? Do you know God? And I'm going to give you that opportunity today. Let's pray. Father, you know every heart here, Lord. You know where they stand. You said in your word that we are to examine ourselves as we find ourselves to be disqualified. Lord, so I'm asking right now that you will speak to every ear, into every ear right now. Youth, young adult, Adult and older. That you speak to all of us, Lord. Lord, even now, just remind us how much you love us. That you left your throne to come to a cross, to be humiliated and spit upon. You suffered our death. 
You, you, you took upon yourself our sins so that we can have life here on earth and in eternity. Oh God, do not let the enemy lie to us no more. But may we understand that your love, your goodness is what leads us to repentance. Listen, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I will be a fool if I don't give you an opportunity to get right with God. And I'm going to ask you to really ask yourself if you really know the Lord or do you just know about Him. There's a big difference. Because when you come across God, there'll be a life-transforming experience. So in a few moments, I'm, in fact, right now, why don't we all stand to our feet? Let's all stand to our feet. They're going to sing. And I'm going to ask you to come and stand right here in front of this pulpit. This pulpit. This is where we pull people out of the pit by the gospel. You stand right here. doesn't matter if you've been coming to church. You need to rededicate your heart to God. You come. You get right with God. Because we're living in the last days. It's seconds before it hits midnight, man. Christ is coming back. You come. We love you. And everyone here is praying for you. We're praying for you. We're, we're fighting for you. Okay? You come. They're singing. You come. 